So when you think about your dreams and your hopes and your relation to them, your progress towards them, what are the stories that you tell yourself? Do you talk about how little time you have? Do you talk about how much is on your plate? Do you sometimes talk about how maybe you feel adrift in other people's priorities or maybe a little lost in the sense of where your own are? I can tell you from five years of researching our book, The One Thing, and five years of teaching it, that those feelings are pretty universal today. People are pinballing from meeting to meeting every single day, rushing from opportunity to obligation at breakneck Pete's space. And they don't always know why they're doing it. Have you ever had that day? You're just running from meeting to meeting. You forget to eat lunch. You wonder when you look at your schedule when you actually get to go to the bathroom. And you make it home, and your spouse asks, hey, what'd you do today? And you actually don't have a good answer. You're just like, I was busy. Right? That's a, that's a tough feeling to live with day in, day out. And it's one of the challenges we wanted to address with our book. You know, time is our most precious asset. We all get the same amount every day, but we don't know ultimately how much we get. And we have hopes and dreams, and we want to accomplish them. So if we could share a different framework, not only how we view time, maybe it's a little bit more limited than we would like to believe, and also how we can connect our someday to today in that order, in reverse, sometimes we can get a lot better results. So in the absence of a good approach to time, I would argue that most people run around every single day acting as if they can know it all, have it all, and do it all. Right? But you can't know it all. Life is way too complex. You can't have it all. There's way too much. And you can't do it all because there's limited time. So I'm a business author. And for maybe five, six years, I've set out to read 50 books every year. That's one of my core goals. I need to get more ideas in so I can get ideas out. And every year, I start off at a great clip. I have my stack of books, and I'm knocking them out one a week, thereabouts, of trying to hit 50 a year, right? A big goal. And I fail every single year. Like everyone else, like Game of Thrones or Westworld comes out, and I lose three weeks. <laughs> but you know what? I look up, and I'm still reading about 45, 46 books a year. And I feel pretty good about that, right? But I'm a business author, and I realized that this year alone, there'll be 15,000 business books published. There were that many last year, and there'll be that many next year. At the pace I can read, failing forward, right, it would take me over 300 years just to read the books that come out this year. So you can't know it all, no matter how purposeful you are, but we can make a more conscientious choice. Understanding that we have limited resources to know it all, we can narrow our focus. I could read a few books on a topic that really matters to me this year and next year and the next year. And over time, that's actually how a lot of expertise is gained, by focusing on the same thing again and again and again. So if you think of that little triangle in the middle, that's our choices. We make choices every single day, but they're not always conscious choices. And the moment we make that conscious choice, we get to choose our slice of that pie. And it's the same for having it all. It doesn't matter if you combine the wealth of Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, right? Together, they couldn't have everything in Washington State, much less Seattle, right? Because there's just too much stuff. And I don't care how addicted you are to Amazon Prime, right? We can, again, be more conscious of how we're going about this. And if having matters to you, we can acquire something that matters, not just to us, but maybe other people. We call it a collection. So depending on your means and your passions, maybe you'll collect cars. Maybe it's the matchbox kind. Maybe it'll be coins. Maybe it'll be four-leaf clovers. I read a story last week, actually, about an Austin architect who is passionate about, you guessed it, plastic coffee lids. He feels so passionately about them that he talks about them, and it's led to one of his lifelong friendships with whom he just published a book called Coffee Lids. And guess what? This is the Smithsonian cult. They would like to have his collection, too. If there was ever a time to say, one man's trash is another man's treasure. <laughs> but you get my point, right? If we're a little bit more conscious, a little bit more aware of what we want, 
then we can have something a lot more meaningful. And it was really this last circle, the can't do it all, that, that made this less of an intellectual game and more of an emotional one for me. Um, my kids were six and seven, and uh, my wife had just launched a real estate business, and we were in the throes of writing this book. We were overwhelmed. We just bought a house. It had a swimming pool, and I was learning how to keep a swimming pool not green. And we were absolutely overwhelmed. And this was going to be our kids' first spring break. And we decided that we were going to take a staycation. And we had this wonderful rationalization. We have a new pool. We want to enjoy it. We're going to see Austin through the eyes of a visitor. And we justified it to ourselves. And I remember I walked into the writing room, and my partner, Gary Keller, he has an older son, so he's like in tune with these things. He goes, hey, where are y'all going for spring break? And I launch into my story about the great staycation, right? And he nods his head, and like a good mentor, he kind of gives me a wake-up call. I remember it. He said, Jay, you know you've only got about 10 left. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he goes, this idea of Jay, Wendy, Gus, and Veronica going on spring break, it's got an expiration date. In 10 years, they're going to be wanting to go with their friends. Or better yet, they're going to want their friends to come with you. And those friends might be boyfriends and girlfriends. It's a whole different dynamic. So if you're really lucky, you might have 10 left. How are you going to use them? I remember I went home to my wife and I was like, we are horrible parents. <laughs> you can laugh about it now, but I mean, the emotion is still a little bit raw. But it was a wake-up call for us. And it was really a blessing. And I remember the next year, we asked a different question. Based on how old our kids were and where we were, what would be the ultimate spring break we could do? And we went to Legoland and the, the San Diego Zoo. And all of our trips have been more purposeful because we're counting backwards on a limited amount of time knowing that there's this window where these kids still want to have fun with us, and it expires. And we've taken them to Italy and France and Costa Rica. And last year, it's a crazy trip of a lifetime. We're actually in the Galapagos Islands. And I remember my wife made the horrible mistake. She has kids, and she starts racking off all these trips that we've done. What's your all-time favorite vacation we've taken? And some of you already know. The staycation. <laughs> So it's our hope that with time and wisdom, they'll appreciate the choices we made. We still feel good about it. But here's what I would ask you. When you think about the time you have and the things that matter to you, does it change the way you want to make some of those choices, knowing that you've only got so many visits left with the grandparents, so many calls left with your folks, so many, so many more get-togethers with your friends, walks with your dog? or in our case, trips with your kids, right? It's, it really gets things crystal clear for us. And it helps us kind of address this challenge of how do we stop pinballing through our days and address our true priorities? And so we look up and we say, how do we keep this important stuff really forefront? How do we keep the important stuff the important stuff? And I'm not just talking about our jobs and that next promotion. I'm talking about the stuff that we pray for in those quiet moments, a fulfilling career, meaningful work, lasting, rewarding relationships, thriving children, you know, the stuff of no regrets. And we think it's about two things, this limited frame of time, right? You don't have forever, folks. We have a limited amount of time. We don't know how long, but it's healthier to look at it that way. And then this other trick, which is a little bit out there and no one teaches it, but in interview after interview with accomplished people, they work backwards from their goals. It's completely counterintuitive. But the best analogy I can give you, if you're a parent, you know this. You know, you go to the restaurant, you get the three shrink-wrapped crayons and a maze. What's the fastest way to finish a maze? You cheat. You start at the finish, and you go to the start. But here's the thing. It's just like life. When we, we see all the choices before us, and by the way, there's lots of dead ends. There's lots of, lots of false turns. And then we have to retread our steps to find the right path. But 
if you start at the end and work backwards, it's remarkable how straight and narrow the path appears to be. All those wrong turns are still there, but it's just so much easier to miss them. And our time works the same way. If you think about all the places right, that you could go in the future, it's just a mini branching tree. But when you look back, you tend to see all the milestones that led you to where you are today. We see our past as the important moments, and the trick is to go into the future and use that same technique back. What led you to be here today? We had 15 minutes on the break. You might start like your story, the whole story with, maybe it was a teacher that sparked a curiosity that just wouldn't fade. Maybe they saw a gift that other people missed. Maybe it was a job or a boss that taught you an important lesson that you decided to carry forward in your life. There are these milestones in our life, and they feel really clear in retrospect. The trick is, how do we flip that forward and work our way back? In our book, The One Thing, right, it started with an idea that Gary Keller had. He taught this probably since 1996. But in interview after interview with these really successful people, they're all doing the same thing. It's start with the end in mind, but with structure. So a big goal doesn't happen overnight. So go out to your someday and say, someday, I would like to look back, this is me and my wife, and think that we nailed it with our kids. They're going off to college, and we nailed it. And then you ask a second question. Based on where I want to be someday, what would we have to accomplish in five years? What would be the one thing, if we nailed it, we would feel like we were absolutely on track for that someday goal. And you write that thing down. And then you go back again. Based on our five-year goal, what would we have to accomplish this year to feel like we were absolutely on track for that? And based on our year, what would we do this month? And based on our month, what would we do this week? And based on our week, what would we do today? And based on our day, what do we need to do right now? Did you see what I was doing there? You're not saying, based on my five-year goal, what do I have to do today? That's bewildering. But if you have worked backwards to your week, you can really accurately figure out what you have to do today to nail your week. And it's that milestone thing. And I'll just be the first to admit, nobody has a crystal ball. You know, the analytics in the crowd, when I teach this to engineers, they're like, well, who really knows in this world of technology where we need to be in five years? And you're right. But at the end of this year, if you look at your answers, you'll be a whole lot clearer of what that next milestone needs to be because you started out in a straight path. And it's kind of one of the ultimate hacks that we can do. It's goal setting to the now. We bring our someday to today. And by the way, that brings lots more motivation and reality to it. So we've got time. We've got this sense of working backwards. And those are the two skills that I hope that you'll take away and apply to your life. I have talked to thousands of folks about this book. And the strange thing is, most of them know what their one thing is. And their presiding sense around it is one of guilt for not doing anything about it. They aren't stopping to ask the question. They're not keeping that awareness in the forefront. And therefore, that sense of overwhelm and regret shows up again and again and again. This is how we break that cycle of kind of pinballing through our days. We focus on a limited amount of time, and we work backwards from our goals. So one of my partners um, in our private equity firm when I was with it, a guy named Mitch, he had this number framed on his wall. And I remember going to his office and going, what's that? And he goes, that is the ultimate equalizer. It's the number of minutes in a day. And I was like, that's awesome. And he was young in his role. He was competing with people who had made billions at what they do. And his strategy was, I'm less experienced. I haven't been in the game. But we all get the same amount of time. If I can just invest it better, I can compete with these guys. And I think he's right. But I want to do the twist that Gary did for you. Before you start thinking that you have all day to get around to it, if you sleep, you've got a lot less time. <laughs> if you work, you've got even less, right? If you've got the average commute, that drops a little bit more. 
And now this theme here, we know about cell phones and distractions. If you watch TV or play with any of those devices, that time really shrinks, right? And by the time you address meals and bathroom breaks, the reality is everybody on average is going to get about two hours a day to stop dreaming and start doing. To stop dreaming and start doing. It doesn't seem like a lot of time, does it? But I can tell you in interview after interview, story after story, that if you do that two hours day in and day out, it adds up to a whole lot. And it adds up faster than you think. It's one of those great secrets, right, on how you get ahead. It's the classic tale of the hare, right, and the tortoise. You just make progress, and it's methodical, but you're working towards a goal. It's not random. And that is how extraordinary success shows up. So I'm going to leave you with just one final question. If you haven't stopped to ask, if you haven't gone out into your future and been willing to think about the things that you really, really want to have happen in your life and work backwards, it's such a small investment of time. It's such a small investment that gives you clarity. It makes you aware of the choices that you're making. What's your one thing? That, by the way, is the key to escaping the maze of overwhelm and stress and regret. That clarity is how you get out. And by knowing what you've said yes to, the amazing, wonderful side benefit, saying yes to something makes it easier to actually say no to everything else. Right? It's like saying I do. Implicit in that was no to everything else. It's a different kind of yes. It's a question worth asking. It's time well spent with yourself. Figure it out. What's your one thing? Thank you.